are currently in Congo Square. This is one of the only places in the US in the 17 and 1800s where enslaved people were allowed to mass congregate. Convict leasing began in the state of Louisiana in 1844 before uh, the Civil War. Convict leasing is essentially giving individuals who are incarcerated to be able to use them for labor and for profit. Convict leasing was uh, a loophole, basically, in emancipation, right? Which is what we're looking at now, um, which is they're not slaves, right? They're free, but they were beasts that needed to be managed. They were being sent there under these vagrancy laws, these black code laws, which only convicted black Louisianans and sent them there if they were without stable housing or stable employment. If they were picked up three times, they could be sent to the convict leasing plantation for life. The language of the 1864 Constitution in the state of Louisiana allowed an exception. It allowed the punishment clause which said essentially that slavery and indentured servitude were outlawed in the state of Louisiana, except in, after convictions of a crime. It's legal through the state's constitution for them to actually own human beings as property. To know that that exists here in this country, I think everybody in, in, in the world should be up in arms. We're violating international laws and treaties simply by having an exception to slavery in our constitutions. And it's not just the federal constitution, it's in your state constitution right here in Louisiana. So you're double damned. You turn into a slave twice through the legislation here. And there's 24 other states that have the same language. In an attempt to educate more people about our situation with the Slavery Exception Clause, I wrote a book. It's called Slave State, Evidence of Apartheid in America. I'm trying or working to demonstrate that the state of Louisiana is practicing an uh, ingenious form of genocide. Racism is tied in the system of Louisiana. Like many, I've never bothered to read 47 words of the 13th Amendment, which all our freedoms are allegedly based on. But when I finally understood, it changed everything. All the pieces fit into place. In 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified. And shortly thereafter, Louisiana changed its constitution again and kept within it this exception to its end of, of slavery. I heard Angela Davis in a speech, she said, that uh, she broke down the 13th Amendment and its exception clause and said we need a 21st century abolitionist movement. When we got to 1901, the state of Louisiana ended its convict leasing program. Instead, the state bought that plantation and it became Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, the largest physical state penitentiary in the United States. It's larger than the island of Manhattan. Eighty-six percent of Angola is actually black, even though black men with of age to go to Angola in the state amount to about 12% of the whole state's population. Once I got to Angola, it was like time it stood still. Tractors, men on horseback with rifles, inmates with straw hats walking up and down cornfields, cotton fields, okra fields, picking, planting. The buildings had not been changed in, since the early 1800s. So it's like, I'm in slavery. If you're sentenced to a felony crime in the state of Louisiana that's violent, you're sentenced to hard labor. I was introduced to the field. I had a tool called a dish blank blade. It's a blade like a scythe, but they're expecting us to go hours on end swinging it. It's about 12 pounds. That doesn't sound like a lot, 
But once you swing it a few times, you get blisters in your hands, you start to really, really feel what this hard labor thing is about. Because your life is on the line. You stop swinging, you get shot. Slavery is not history, and this is my real life. When you talk about Louisiana State Penitentiary, people across the country would say, is that the place that has the rodeo? They put a card table out in the middle of the arena, put four chairs and men who are incarcerated, sit at the table with a deck of cards, and they release a ball. And the last person to move from that card table gets $100. When you think about this incentive pay, and you think about what someone would risk for $100, you have to wonder whether any of this is voluntary. We have not moved to the point where Black Louisianans are free from enslavement. It's more like free it. Free it. So their argument is, we have every right to actually uh, send you out, make more money off of you where you're not actually making any money at all. Um, but, but, but we can also pat ourselves on the back and say that this is gonna be some sort of uh, way for you to build your character and rehabilitate yourself. There's a corporation that gets money from your labor. Prison Enterprises is a company that solely benefits from the labor of the, the punished. And that is what you call institutionalized slavery because they only pay two cents an hour, um, which is 40 cents a week. A bar of soap costs 89 cents. So you would have to work two and a half weeks even to buy a bar of soap. They have to buy things so that they can work. Work shirts, work boots. And there's something called union supply, and that's how you get these things. These are the same rates and somewhat higher than what we would pay for out here. In context, a sick call, if you wake up one day and you feel ill, is $3. Um, if you're out in the field and an emergency happens, a medical emergency, and you need an emergency sick call, that's $6. The way that the Department of Corrections compensates people with what they call incentive pay is that you might make those wages, but half of them go into a savings account and the other half become uh, uh, what you would think would be like accessible. Except you can't ex access those funds until you've made a total of $250. So while funds are going into your account, they're being pulled back out for the costs that the state is incurring to provide you medical care. And your savings side, which can't be touched by those expenses, is not growing at any large rate. So you have individuals like some of our clients who may have been in for 19, 20 years and only made $100 um, that they're given when they walk out the door. And they were never able to access any of their incentive money while they were incarcerated. And if you do not work, you can be sent to solitary confinement. If you cut yourself in the field, you can be sent to solitary confinement because it looks like you might have done it on purpose to get out of work. I want people to really understand what prison labor looks like. They're the folks who clean the floors, paint the walls, care to those who are dying, or do the tutoring and education programs. Pick the produce that you see in Whole Foods and other grocers. Those who are incarcerated in our prisons do a number of different aspects of labor. Those who are incarcerated working those same jobs, putting forth that same skill in labor, are getting paid 20 cents at most. There aren't any bathrooms in the field. Once you get to a certain age where you can't do anything, they have a hospice ward and you know, your, your bed sores aren't gonna get taken care of. So these people are dying in prison and our tax money is paying for it.
The Carcerate Louisiana began in Angola prison, sitting on a penal colony in the middle of nowhere. We were just an underground movement that began to be labeled as Decarcerate Louisiana um, in more later times at that point. But it started with just the brothers in prison wanting to see some type of fairness and justice in the system. is one of the strongest brothers that I've met. Real street soldier. Used to be a rapper, um, called him Kid Vicious at the time in New Orleans. He actually was one of the pioneers of New Orleans rap music. And he found himself with a life sentence coming into my cell in Angola prison. And we started his political education in that cell. Um, we started playing chess together. We have to give our founders big shout outs Lama is one of the most intelligent people that I've met. It was his idea to form Decarcerate Louisiana. Without that brother, we wouldn't even be sitting here right now. And I was like, yo, if you're gonna put this together, you need somebody who's on the outside to be the person to talk to the representatives, the legislators and stuff like that. You know, Loma is brilliant, as you said before. He's, he's great, but he's inside of a prison and that's gonna cause some problems if he tries to be that person. And he said, I got the perfect person for you, Max. <laughs> and he mentioned your name, Curtis Davis. Because Ray Louisiana is international, we, started in Louisiana with the idea that said that Louisiana cross raised more people per capita than any place on the planet Earth. Louisiana has the highest number of people incarcerated. Louisiana has the highest percentage of people serving life without parole. And a lot of people I'm realizing think that when you get sentenced to life without parole that you really don't spend your life in prison. Because before Truth and Sentencing Act, you know, people would get sentenced to life and it'd be like 20 years to 30 years, you know, just different numbers. But no, it's life. You're in prison for life. We need to change that narrative and bring those numbers down. Two important things that the Louisiana criminal system does that prevents us from ever really having meaningful change in our criminal system is that it kills people for crimes and it enslaves people for crimes. The death penalty and forced labor really remove all credibility from our system. And if we don't change those two parts before we continue to do the other work we talk about, it's just like putting Band-Aids on, on knife wounds that can't heal without those changes. HB 196 is a, a, a bill that was presented um, to the House of Representatives this past legislative session. And what it was doing was removing the slavery exception clause from the Louisiana Constitution. I talked to Edmund Jordan on a number of occasions about this. And he was very much excited about championing HB 196, which will end slavery. House Bill 196 was decarcerated Louisiana's first attempt to change the law, to take away the safe slavery exception clause. Um, our bill was sponsored by a representative um, Jordan from Baker or Baton Rouge area and he was a um, black representative going up against a very conservative um, majority Caucasian Senate um, representative panel. I knew that we would be in for a hard fight to take away this um, exception clause but the, the mindset was that if slavery is bad it's morally incorrect if it was bad then, it should be bad now, and it shouldn't be any problem in 2021 to get this removed from law. That was naive and gullible thinking, right? By the time we went in, we realized that this is very, very serious. The problem that I have when I actually read this is I think this might be one of the most dangerous bills we've seen this session. Dangerous in the sense that we want to remove slavery from your laws. A country that's supposed to be the land of the free, home of the brave, that still have black people enslaved at numbers that were higher than the clerk had in South Africa. Decarcerate Louisiana had been preparing to testify before a committee at the state capitol. We got, I 
it was around 24 hours or less than 24 hours notice about the committee hearing that we were going to have to be there. A lot of the things that we had prepared didn't go through. There were about five of us there that were able to testify, so it didn't go as we expected, but we got there and it seemed like the main players had already made up their, just their minds. I want to hear the testimony of other people, but I'm just giving you warning. I'm probably going to move to involuntarily defer the bill. The dynamics whenever you walk into these committee hearings um, is set up to be intimidating. It's set up to show that they're more powerful and you're less powerful. Um, walking in we seen that they were sitting up on a higher platform than us. They were facing us. And whenever we sat at the table, we were sitting kind of like at a lower stance than they were. That in itself is intimidating, you know? And then looking at their faces, either they're disinterested, looking at their phones, looking away, um, looking like they don't agree with you. Um, or, I mean, like I said, it was five legislators that voted in favor of this, so. There were a few faces of empathy and care. As we all know in here, it's difficult to find a job, difficult to find housing, and, and I just feel like this, this would be a good investment by the state as well to um, work on recidivism, but also allow people to assist their, their children and families while they're incarcerated. So I, I support this. Brother Curtis Davis was there, as well as the rest of the organizers for Decarcerate Louisiana, and we had nine white Republican senators there. And all nine of them voted unanimously not to remove the exception clause and effectively allow slavery to continue legally in their state, despite the fact that three other states had already done the same thing without a problem. This bill would have also been a constitutional amendment. So what we were doing was bringing forward legislation before lawmakers across Louisiana who are duly elected from various parts of the state um, to give us, the citizens and voters, the right within this state to nullify um, and repeal that slavery exception clause. So if the bill would have voted favorably out of committee and onto the state floor, um, we would have been voting on that as a constitutional amendment. But um, unfortunately, that didn't pass. I hear people tell me a lot of times that this is symbolic, and I have so much pushback against that. First of all, we're a nation of laws. Well, what laws are we a nation of? The supreme law of the land is the Constitution. The second most supreme law is the state constitutions. That's what we put everything on. There's nothing in the Constitution that's symbolic. In some ways, removing the exception likely would not change much about the day-to-day -day lives for those who are incarcerated, but it would start the process for trying to make that change. The first thing that occurs is you get your constitutional rights back. The only rights that you're allowed are those that the prison industry has deemed you should have. They say that there's watchdogs who watch out for like your Eighth Amendment violations of cruel and unusual punishment, but this is happening all day, every day, all across America. So these Eighth Amendment violations aren't even uh, being addressed that are happening in Louisiana prisons. One of the things that people say, it's like, well, aren't there workplace safety rules that should keep someone safe when they're working in prison? And then we have these cases that say, those don't apply to you if you're incarcerated. There were other people who were incarcerated in other states who have brought forward their claims in federal court about being paid a fair minimum wage. And because of that slavery exception clause, their claim was not upheld because they are considered property of the state. They are considered a lower class of citizenship. So when you talk about like, why wouldn't ending the punishment clause on its own fix all of these problems because we have built a whole economy of labor that has been outside of the scope of our pre-existing laws for safety, for employment discrimination, 
for wage an hour. And we can't just stop at changing the punishment clause to our prohibition on slavery. But we can't exist if any much longer if we don't change it. The federal courts up to the United States Supreme Court can stop actions being taken by states that, that violate the U.S. Constitution. But states can change their laws in a way that, that create more protections for individuals than the federal constitution. So eliminating, for instance, a provision allowing for continued slavery and indentured servitude in Louisiana could be done. But for instance, violating the U.S. Constitution could not. The states need to provide protection for their citizens from slavery and human trafficking allowed by their own constitutions. And if they don't have any language in their constitution, then they need to put in anti-slavery language to protect their citizens from the federal amendment. And the reason we need to get all these states to do so is not only to protect their citizens, but also by the time we reach 2024, which is our projected date of ratification for the federal amendment, we'll already have enough legislators from the states and we'll have that three quarters number that we'll need to change history in this country. New Orleans is the home of the civil rights movement. It's the birthplace of the civil rights movement. If you ask the average person whether, when was slavery abolished, they're gonna tell you um, oh, slavery was abolished in whatever time the, the, the encyclopedia says it was abolished in 1865 or whatever. But the real fact is slavery was never abolished. Well, um, all we can do is just push forward with our work and we can't give up. And the only thing that makes sense to all of us is to bring this bill forward again. My favorite abolitionist, Masada Shakur, Angela Davis. Whenever I come in spaces of challenging times or conflict, I think of their leadership and what they would do. It's always come from the people. It was a fight. And so we realized that we're gonna have to fight and we're gonna have to do that by getting people on board and getting people to know how important this is and what's happening to their loved ones. And so that whole idea of that like, being very omnipresent, especially in the jails, and we know it's still omnipresent from juvie halls to the prisons. Music and call and response and rhythm and just keeping our, keeping our voices audible so we remember we're still here has always been integral to our survival. The other night I was talking to my wife and she said, what do you think the world is supposed to look like after you do all this? I picture a world where when I drive down the streets and a police car gets behind me, my heart doesn't stop beating hard. I doesn't, I'm not afraid. I picture a world where there's not an eviction notice on my door, even though I, I make more than the average person. I, I, I envision a world where we don't have food banks, where everybody has food, clothing, and shelter. I just envision a world where we can finally have peace. We have the opportunity to actually end slavery in the United States for the first time in our history. And I'm hoping that people that watch this documentary come to the conclusion that we have come to, that there is nothing more important in this country right now than ending slavery once and for all. So stand up now and let's do this. Senator Luna moves final passage of House Bill 298 Machines are open. All those in favor vote yay. Those opposed vote nay. And the secretary will open the machines. 34 yays and zero nays. And the bill's finally passed. Senator Luna moves to reconsider the vote by which the bill passed. Lay that motion on the table without objection.
journalist, freelance writer. I'm an activist. I'm a believer in myself and my people. I'm an ex-slave from Louisiana. My favorite book would have to be Les Miserables by Victor Hugo because when I read it, I began to understand the machinations to how a penal colony is run. Um, Les Miserables is a design that put the poor people on the, 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 the square bottom to where all classes are able to stand on top of an economic system that is done on purpose. So when you see that level of poverty in France, the way that they set it up, they mimic it in the new Orleans or the new um, Road Royal in, in Louisiana. So I learned so much about Louisiana by reading that book about the miserable.